We welcome you inside our studios here in the ATL. It is game time, the free agent fever edition, and we still have it with big moves being made today. Casey Stern, Smitty Stu, and our money man, the capologist himself, Eric Pincus, a cast of thousands. Andre Iguodala will be on this show, but uh, we begin with big news of the day brought to you by the guy who made the news, Kyle Lowry, the Players' Tribune, saying, for me, at the end of the day, easy decision. All the roads led me back to the same place home. They all led me back to Toronto, that and the $100 million for three years as well. As we welcome in our own Hall of Famer and David Aldridge. And uh, DA, you know, we figured that this would happen, but it happens at the year total Toronto would like, right? And the AAV, I guess, with the value that Lowry would like per year. Absolutely. Um, there's no way he gets $33 million per, per year, you know, <laughs> any, way, any other way than on a short deal. And so this works for him. Short term, it keeps uh, Toronto happy at the back end. You didn't have to give them five years at, at you know eight-figure salaries per year, and that that would have really hamstrung them. And it keeps him and Demar Derozan together, and I think that was very important for both of them. They've built the Raptors into a very strong team in the East, uh, giving them some playoff uh, seasons in a row, and I think they like to build on that and have even more success. So, for that to happen, he had to stay. And, and it makes sense, especially once you commit what they committed to Serge Ibaka earlier in the day. You don't do that unless you're going to resign Lowry as well. All right. So, you know, Eric, when you look at the financials and you add Ibaka $65 million and you look where they are, what can they do now? Are they hamstrung? Where are we in the tax? Everything's about taxes. <laughs> well, they are in the tax. Uh, we're talking roughly $21 million. So that's a lot of money, right? Now, they, they still don't have a small forward to replace P.J. Tucker. I'll say first, I'm happy that they made this deal. This was the right deal because you're in a win-now mode. We don't know how long the Cavs are going to be the Cavs. You brought back DeRozan the year before. What are you, what are you doing otherwise, right? What, why are we playing this game? So they put the money in. Now you've got to put, five, I think, $5 million more. They have the taxpayer mid-level. Go and get one more player, but the challenge there is that tax would jump up another, let's say, $15 million on top of it. That $5 million player costs 20 So to me, the next step is finding a home for Jonas Valanciunas. Uh, there was some rumor, maybe Corey Joseph to Indiana. I don't know how if that happens, but at least it's out there. Uh, Damari Carroll, find a way to get out of a player, one that you can aff afford to lose, and I think that's Valanciunas. Now especially they're going to look for more minutes for Norman Powell after the way he played in the playoffs. D.A., uh, we had uh, you know, kind of dance partners go lower and lower for Paul Millsap, who's a terrific player. Phoenix was out. Minnesota was out. Denver was on one side of the dance floor and Millsap on the other. And how did we get these two fine people together? <laughs> it, was like the, it was like Tony and Mar Maria, West Side Story, they saw each other across the dance floor and they just they couldn't resist. So it was an easy call. Uh, look, it, it makes sense for, for Millsap. It makes sense for the Nuggets. He wanted a payday, which he has earned uh, by being an all-star several years in a row. Uh, they needed a veteran. They needed a four who could help stretch the floor for them. Uh, they, they did get uh, Trey Lyles from Utah in the draft day trade. So now they've got an all-star caliber player up front to play next to Jokic and really I think will help Jokic a lot in terms of spacing the floor, giving him room to operate inside uh, and, and gives a good nucleus of Denver's team a, a veteran player who can still play and give them a, a chance to win. It's just, it, it just makes sense for both, both Denver and for Millsap uh, to get this done and they got it done. Smitty, I know Nuggets fans excited about Millsap. We saw Jokic and his development why are they a great combo together? Well, I think, one, you have a guy that can stretch the floor. D.A. talked about it. Then I also have a guy that can score on a block, and they can be interchangeable, both those guys. They both are terrific passers. And then you have guys that are good guys. I love Jokic, the Joker, you know that. And I always love Paul Millsap because he's a pro. And you look at Denver, they're getting a veteran. They're getting a great locker room guy, and a guy that instantly would be okay chemistry-wise. And then with those young guys, Stu talked about it. You have a team that doesn't need five dribbles, ten dribbles. Guys can cut. Guys can catch and shoot. They have high basketball IQ, and they have a lot of two-way players. So I think this is a perfect fit for Paul Millsap. All right, from one-on-one uh, -on -one DA, let's go to some speed dating with Gordon Hayward because that's what he's been doing, right? He went to Miami. They got billboards. Uh, then he goes to Boston at Fenway Park. They have a sign. He's got a meeting on Monday with Utah management. Are we in an even race maybe with the three for Gordon Hayward services? Well, I, I think so, Casey. 
50-50 because I think each of these three teams has a compelling story to sell to Gordon Hayward. I mean, if you're Boston, you were the number one seed in the East. You have added uh, the third pick in the draft. You have the first pick maybe next year in the draft. And you need a, a dynamic player to kind of pull it all together. And if you're Miami, you've rebuilt that thing. You're close to being a playoff team again. It's Miami. They don't have to sell too much. <laughs> People want to go down there and play, and you've got guys that to play with. And then for, if you're Utah, you say, hey, you grew up with us. You know, you know our coaches, you know the team, you know how we play. You're becoming a star in this league, playing in this system. And we have an opportunity to go even further if we keep this group together, but the key is to keep you here. So each one of these teams has a very, very good narrative that makes sense for Gordon Hayward. Still, we know how good a player Hayward is. Where, where does he fit best? Is it back where he was in Utah or elsewhere? Well, there's not a player in free agency that has better options <coughs> than Gordon Hayward because he fits very well in all three of these places. If you're in Utah, it's a place he's comfortable with. It's a place that they can pay him the most money. It's a system that he's familiar, and he understands how to be productive in that system, uh, albeit that you know George Hill is probably not going to be there anymore. If you're in Boston, uh, boy, that's a culture the same as it is in Utah, one that's just predicated on nobody taking the credit or no one caring who takes the credit, a system where the ball's being moved, players are being moved, there's a sense of unselfishness as a part of their culture, and some, somewhere where he'd be able to fit in, and he gets to play for his college coach in Brad Stevens, one of the best in the NBA, or... Do I go to Miami and play for one of the best coaches in the NBA and Eric Spolstra and in Pat Riley's organization? But there maybe there is a little bit of a rub in that the system offensively, there are a couple people, if they retain Deion Waiters and they have Gorgon Dragic, they need the ball in their hand a little bit more, and that may take away from Hayward's game. Also, if I'm Gordon Haywood, I just made my first all-star team. I'm probably not going to make it again if I stay in Utah. I may have a shot in Boston or Miami. i choose one of those places. Boston would be my pick. If he gets to the East, he'll have to deal with D.C., the improvement of John Wall and Bradley Beal. And how about this man, Otto Porter, who shot it as well as anybody last season. But now, will he give a shot to someone else? The game of Otto Porter last year up big time. We talked about the improvement of Antetokounmpo and Jokic and others, but how about what Porter did is he was big third part of the trio for the Wiz. Well, now not three, but four years, $106 million max offer from the Kings. So what about it? Is it just a power play to get to D.C. or not? We get a chance to talk more about the Wizards. Candace Buckner, Washington Post, kind enough to join us. So, Candace, uh, I think we knew when there wasn't a deal that eventually somebody else, whether Brooklyn or Sacramento, would do this. So here we are. What's the next step in this situation between D.C. and getting Porter back in? Well, it doesn't seem like there will be a lot of drama because from all indication that, um, you know, the Wizards have been um, – telling reporters, myself included, they're going to match. Whatever price Otto brings back, they're going to match, including this, uh, this max deal. So, of course, you know, they have 48 hours after the, uh, the moratorium ends, but this is their core. He's, part, he's a big part of what they, what they believe uh, in this team, and that can contend in the East. So they had to bring him back and um, apparently won't scoff at a max. You know, I know, Candace, there was a lot of conversation, really for everyone except Oklahoma City, right, to get Paul George. You put him in a lot of different jerseys around the league, but a lot of talk about Washington having interest, making a move like that. Once he was out of the way, did it solidify once and for all that it was going to be a necessity and an inevitability that it would be Otto Porter who would be brought back, and that would be the big move of the offseason? Right. Well, you know, 29 teams made phone calls to the Pacers about Paul George. Of course, you know, Washington – um, express some interest, but what do they really have re realistically to uh, to get into that sweep that sweepstakes? Um, and again, from the beginning of uh, Otto's really uh, ascendant season, he's been the guy that they they said they they're going to bring back. Um, Paul George would have been great here, but um, just didn't seem like a realistic option. Candace, appreciate it. Keep the uh, cell phone uh, handy. Happy 4th to you. Talk to you again soon. Thanks again. Uh, let's get Thank more you. on this. Our own David Aldridge is here. DA, you know, Otto Porter was a huge piece. I don't think people talked about nationally enough how good he was last year. How important, even if it is inevitable, of a move is this for this franchise? 
Oh, it, it's crucial, Casey. Look, his numbers are off the charts good uh, for this team. And more importantly, he's just he's a great fit with Wall and Beal. Uh, it, he just works with them very well. And so, yeah, I, I, you can't keep replacing your starting small forward. They did it a few years ago with Trevor Ariza. Then Paul Pierce was there for a year. So they can't keep starting over at that position. This is a young guy that they drafted and that they have developed, helped develop, and he's grown into a very, very good player for them. Is the sticker shock a little much? Yeah, it is. But at the end of the day, if you're trying to compete in the East, we saw Toronto do it earlier today. You've got to keep your group together as best you can. Now, the trade-off is, might be hard, in fact, probably will be hard, for them to keep Boyan Bogdanovich. They got him at the trade deadline last year from Brooklyn for a first-round pick, but as part of that deal, they jettisoned the salary of Andrew Nicholson, and that was a big chunk of money that was going to be tied up otherwise. By doing that, they feel like they can match Otto Porter on anything, including a max offer, and not have too much pain in terms of luxury tax. Now, if you re-sign Bogdanovich, it starts to sting a little. Well, it's a, it's a good point to bring up, D.A., and let's find out from our capologist, Eric Pincus, because, and I don't want to take away, they did add Tim Frazier when we got to the start of this whole thing, who will help. They were in need of a backup point. Brandon Jennings is a free agent, so now we expect that this will be matched. When you plug yeah. in the numbers, is Bogdanovich or is anyone else a possibility after that? Actually, yes, but it depends on the tax. So do they want to pay the tax? And that's always, that's where, that's the NBA question. Are we ready to pay the tax? Are we close enough to do so? Uh, what they did, though, is they, they made a deal to, to bring in Jody Meeks from the Orlando Magic. And they're using what is called the biennial exception. It's about $3 million. And when you use that, you lock in a hard cap. So this will be one of the teams that has a hard cap at $125 million. Now, they could pay Boyanovic. I have it down at maybe $12 million. Bogdanovich. It's Boyan Bogdanovich. I get confused with the, the guy in Sacramento who yeah. has the same name, basically. Yeah, yeah. Bogan or... Bogan Boyanovich. Yeah, I'll, I'll figure it's, it's, it out once... Yes. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just... And he's coming this year, too. He's coming to the Kings this year. Yes, so, yes. Uh, you got to figure that out when, when the time comes. But basically, they're, they're okay if they want to pay the tax. Right. Other than that, if they don't pay Bogdanovich, then they got $8.4 million, the mid-level, to go after someone else. And that's the question. Is there someone else who's better... And can they go into the tax? And is $12 million enough for Bogdanovich? Well, here's the thing. The Wizards are not, if you're at home, you watched D.C. last year. Guys, they're not going to get Paul George, so they're not going to vault anywhere different. But let, let's not throw away. We all know the issue of why they couldn't beat the Celtics. The bench point scoring was like a million to like four. So Tim Frazier, Jody Meeks, you're starting to get a little bit deeper as a team. Otto Porter, Smitty, development last year, as I said, Greek freak, Jokic, a lot of talk about those, but how about the improvement you saw one year to the next of Otto You know, uh, only complaint I had, Stu and Casey and Eric, uh, he didn't shoot enough. And uh, calling that game in the playoffs, I talked to Scott Brooks, he said we were encouraging him to shoot more. I think he's a great fit, a fantastic young man, um, a kid that sometimes you look at a kid, what he goes through, Playing at Georgetown, a high pick, those first couple of years, I mean, it was tough on him. Mm -hmm. People were saying he couldn't play. So to be a guy to take his craft and increase the numbers the way he increased in shooting percentage and still able to play defense and fit in with guys who take a lot of shots, I think he's a perfect fit for a lot of teams. Yes, the number is high, but I don't think the Wizards, like D.A. said, they couldn't afford to lose him. But you're right. Losing him would have made that bench even worse. So I think they had to have him. You know, and the question is, can they be better, Stu? Because Otto Porter continues to improve. We saw John Wall take it to another level. Bradley Beal, who added not just a shot, he's getting to the basket. Can the guys they have, if they can't add anyone else, can they be a better team this year than they were last year? Well, I don't think there's any question because of their youth. I mean, you saw John Wall, at least in my mind, take a huge step in terms of not only his performance level, but just his ability to to run a franchise team. Bradley Beal stayed healthy and played at a very high level. But Otto Porter just had the best of his four years uh, as a Washington Wizards, and he's improved in scoring and rebounding each of those seasons. But you have a guy, this guy, you understand, he shot 52% from the field. 52% from the field and 43 from three. I mean, and you talk about chemistry and fit with a team. Mm -hmm. You know, personality-wise, Otto's a terrific young man. Not a, he, he's not what I would call an alpha dog, but you don't need one when you got John Wall and Bradley Beal on the team. And the reason that he maybe didn't shoot as much is that he's a guy you don't need to run things for. He can get his off the glass. He picks up, you know, offensive rebound. He makes open shots. Tremendous fit. But to lose him out of that starting lineup with Gortat, Morris, 
Beal and Wall and not have Otto Porter there would have been a huge blow. But now if you're the Wizards, you've got your core together, your starting five. Now it's time to go and see what you can find on the cheap in the open market to really bolster that bench. And if they do that, they're going to take a step.